a year ago, we welcomed Andy Duncan as uh, the new president of the Advertising Association. And it's been Andy's wisdom um, that's elevated a single part of the agenda. And in a word, it's responsibility. And it was in this spirit that Andy and Scylla, who led the wonderful group, uh, and thank you, Scylla, um, for curating um, the programme uh, as Great Lead 2015, but Andy Scylla and I decided to turn to a giant of advertising to address um, this responsibility topic today. Now, it's a cliche to say, say that um, Richard Eyre needs no introduction. I mean, a lot of you know him. Um, some of you will know him as, as, the, as the person who is consistently voted the best speaker at the Advertising Association's me, uh, media business course. Others will say BBH's first media director, former boss of both Capital Radio and ITV, chairman of the Internet Advertising Bureau, CBE, and, uh, and um, one of two Advertising Association's Macintosh medal holders in the room, um, Polar Explorer, both North and South. Uh, what can you say? How about, come on up, Richard. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the annual advisory board um, for advertising PLC. Uh, I'm glad you're all here because we have a problem. As you know, we've invested in acquiring uh, new and exciting technology. Uh, we've invested a lot of uh, effort in understanding how it works and that it has the potential to transform our customers' engagements with audiences. This is the biggest thing for years. But these techniques only work when advertising is trusted. Embarrassingly and, and rather ironically, our brand, advertising, has an image problem. So the point of this board meeting is for us to look at the evidence, to understand the problem, to root out those of our conventional wisdoms, which are more conventional than wise, and return to work with some solutions. OK, enough of this prettiness. Advertising is not trusted at the very moment when it needs to be. And this is because we claim that if it's legal to sell something, it should be legal to advertise it. We therefore press the Advertising Association to go into bat to fight for something that we call a right, but which is at best a tolerance. I think this is a misuse of the AA, which rather than defending a consensus of our vested interests, should be leading our sector uh, into a new best practice. So that's it. That's really, that's what I intend to say. Um, here are the supporting arguments. Uh, trust is in diminishing supply. According to the uh, Edelman Annual Trust Barometer this year, there is a steady decline in trust in, in all kinds of institutions, government, in religion, in the media, interestingly also technology and, and innovation. Now some of that may be for perfectly commendable reasons, you know, a, a, a growth in individualism, a greater sense of, of freedom of thought and so on. Uh, otherwise it might be just kind of plain cynicism, scepticism, uh, or maybe a shared sense that the world is just a bit more complex than we thought, um, uh, less susceptible to that sort of mustn't grumble cheeriness of the post-war years. But that decay has affected uh, all of business, and marketing and advertising, the language of business, has not been spared. Uh, research from the AA shows that over the last 20 years, the 51% of the public who describe themselves as favourable to advertising has fallen to 27%. The 17% uh, who describe themselves as unfavourable has, over that same period, grown to 28. So 28 beats 27, and so the first time since our records began, the no's now have it. And the biggest vote is from the growing number of people who, frankly, don't give a damn either way. One in six people feel bombarded by advertising today and compare that with one in 14 a, day, a, a decade ago. Just before Christmas, an episode of The Moral Maze discussed the ethics of advertising, and during the programme, it was variously described as, I quote, an unavoidable evil in a free capitalist society, basically manipulative. Claire Fox said, we know that advertising isn't the truth, it isn't journalism. <laughs> right. <laughs> And the daddy of them all, Matthew Taylor, chief executive of the Royal Society of Arts, said this. Advertising is a brilliant, ruthless, shameless conspiracy 
to persuade us to buy stuff on the basis of myth and emotion rather than wisdom and prudence. So just when brands are actively pursuing ways to build trusting relationships with their customers, advertising itself, their most expensive communication tool, stands accused of a failure of conscience. So I agree with the headline for this event that it is time for us to seek out a new deal for advertising with a new ethical underpinning, which won't be easy, but stick with me, neither will it bankrupt us. Ethics change. Um, ethics, I think, is a, is a branch of taste and convention rather than a, a sort of branch of morality where it is somehow cemented. So, for example, scenes that were censored from um, X-rated movies in the 1980s routinely make it into PGs today. Exhibit one, the outpouring of angst uh, around the Sainsbury's 2014 Christmas commercial. Personally, I have to say I was unable to summon any sense of outrage uh, and had to be told that it was um, offensive to use a war to sell turkeys or chocolate. But many people were upset and the discussion lit up the social media, making uh, this the most viewed ad on YouTube last year as people crowded around to see and join in the fight. Compare the 1979 ad for Silk Cut. It was set uh, as the opening super told us in Mbongo land, which is a little awkward. Uh, it featured a blacked up John Bird, awkward, uh, talking to the camera in a fake South African accent, awkward. The setting was a siege of British troops in the Boer Wars and the story was that to appreciate the wonderfully mild taste of silk cut, you needed to trial it for at least two weeks. And as John Bird said to the British commanding officer amid hysterical laughter from his warriors, and that about how long you got. After two weeks, uh, we cut to the end of the siege, the cream of British manhood, defending their garrison with SIGs firmly wedged between their teeth, saying, sorry, every time they bayoneted a Zulu. This attracted no ethical angst for its use of an event that claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, for its use of blatant race, racism in the noble cause not of celebrating an inspiring moment of humanity on the centenary of a global catastrophe, but of flogging fags. And it won multiple awards. Things change. Right now, there is a sea change going on in the principles underlying good business. For many years, our business ethic has been underpinned by a philosophy expressed by Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist and the founder of monetarism. In 1970, he wrote, the only entities which can have responsibilities are individuals. A business cannot have responsibilities. He went on, so the question is, do corporate executives, provided they stay within the law, have responsibilities in their business activities other than to make as much money for their, for their stockholders as possible? And my answer to that is, no, they do not. This was in an article for the New York Times uh, entitled, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Profits. Well, Milt, Nobel Prize or not, I think I disagree with about every component of that statement, including its, it, its, its philosophical underpinning that business cannot have responsibilities. And yet the simple pragmatism of Friedman's thinking still, in most places, defines the primary goal of business. This is understandable. I mean, you know, frankly, it's, it's much more practical than the minefield of judgments that we've got to navigate if we step beyond these comfortable boundaries. It posits a score sheet uh, which motivates and measures not just Gordon Geckos, but also right-thinking good people like you and I. For the majority of my time in business, going all out for shareholder return has been a fine ambition, dignified and incentivized by most companies' remuneration schemes. Contrast this, the first page in the current Unilever annual report. It says, our first priority is to our consumers, then customers, employees, suppliers, and communities. When we fulfill our responsibilities to them, we believe that our shareholders will be rewarded. Talking to The Guardian, Paul Polman, Unilever's CEO and the architect of this sustainable living plan said, I don't think our fiduciary duty is to put shareholders first. I say the opposite. What we firmly believe is that if we focus our company on improving the lives of the world's citizens and come up with genuine sustainable solutions, we are more in sync with consumers and society, and ultimately this will result in good shareholder returns. So the argument is, 
that if we apply our considerable commercial acumen, acumen to the short term, you, the shareholders, will get far less than if we put you in, the, in this appropriate place in the pecking order. But here's the thing. In the Milton Friedman model, ethics are the enemy of profit. Sourcing raw materials from suppliers who treat their workers with respect and humanity costs more. Ensuring the sustainability of natural supplies demands an investment program that doesn't trouble the balance sheet of the profiteer in the short term. You see, Unilever has 500,000 people worldwide who want to work for it, people in 180 countries whose personal values are already aligned to those values we've just heard expressed. So it doesn't need vast internal programs to establish and support a culture or extract discretionary effort from its people because their purpose in going to work is already united with the purpose of the business. So do we think that the Unilever approach is ethical, driven in some dangerous or rarefied way by morals and values, or pragmatic, just plain good business? Follow Dove's campaign for real beauty in social media, the life boy help a child reach five, or even Ben and Jerry's commitment to um, source every ingredient from fair trade sources, and I think you'll see that customers appear to like these principles quite a lot. Ethical or pragmatic? And Unilever's push for purpose and values is not unique on today's business stage. Just one example, Rose Macario, the CEO of Patagonia, has tripled profits while driving an, an uncompromising conservation ethic uh, for Patagonia through her supply chain. Uh, and that's, this is no kind of marketing con confection. This has not been dreamed up on an away day. This is, her, this is her personal passion. And she was an investment banker. I'm just saying. Passion or not... Um, underlying all this modern ethics is, of course, one enormous and undeniable change, which makes it relevant and even mandatory for us all. In Theodore Levitt's 1970 treatise on the morality of advertising, which is worth a read, he writes, the consumer is an amateur, the producer an expert. In the commercial arena, the consumer is an impotent midget. He is certainly not king. The producer is a powerful giant. It is an uneven match. Well, not anymore, Ted. We all know that the match just got a good deal more even. Word of mouth is now a mass medium, more powerful than any paid-for advertising, so the balance has tipped away from the giants with the deep pockets in favour of the newly potent midgets. Garish or insupportable claims on behalf of brands will be exposed and queried and probably pilloried in social media. And furthermore, today's consumer will not tolerate a pretty face painted on a brand uh, whose production has involved human or ecological anguish. A recent report by the Foundation, a brilliant growth and innovation consult consultancy on whose advisory board I sit, uh, put it like this. To earn trust from consumers and win their emotional loyalty requires an organisation to do and be seen to do the right thing consistently. And in an increasingly transparent and networked world, exposing organisations or individuals within them who are doing the wrong thing has never been easier. Doing the right thing uh, it is a moving target. So unless your position is motivated by religious or absolutist uh, political ideology, the ethical centre line will demand judgment. People of equal integrity will feel strongly and differently about where that line should be drawn which makes it very hard to reach consensus among, lar among large groups like businesses, business sectors, institutions, or indeed advertising associations. But hard is, is no reason not to try, to, to impact society for good. Just as in the Industrial Revolution, business people acting on conviction brought about meaningful change. The Cadburys, the Roundtrees, the Leavers, the Ricketts, the Colemans, the Collieries, the shipbuilders, uh, the miners built villages um, f to, to house their workers. And the logic of each of them was that decent housing would make happy and healthy workers. Ethical or, pra or pragmatic? These business leaders proved a point to which we can now return, that ethical actions are not the antithesis of pragmatic business sense. In the Edelman Trust Barometer, which I referred to earlier, 53% of people ascribe their loss of trust in business to its failure to contribute to the greater good. 81% of respondents believe that business can both make a profit and improve society. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for advertising? 
Right now, our guiding principle is that if it's legal to sell it, it should be legal to advertise it. Do you see what just happened there? We just ducked any ethical position of our own. That means that the Advertising Association ritually joins battle with those who want to reduce consumption of some contentious product by banning or constraining advertising. Off we shove them. When I joined the industry, the AA was battling to, to defend our right to advertise tobacco. And to that end, it produced tons of research that proved that advertising didn't uh, actually encourage people to smoke. Uh, it, it just promoted brand switching among those who were already lost to the habit. In the discussions about the role of advertising in child obesity, major figures in our industry could be heard vigorously extolling uh, the effectiveness of advertising to one audience whilst piously reassure, reassuring another that there's no evidence that great commercials add to children's desire for fatty or sugary foods. This is obviously bollocks. And, <laughs> and, and worse than being wrong, it, it positions our industry as being shifty and craven. If it's legal to sell it, it should be legal to advertise it, it really doesn't cut it anymore. It's simple, like the simple produce, pursuit of profit, but in a world that is looking for business to improve society, it is also laissez-faire and lazy. Replacing it will be hard, because we cannot relax back into the arms of the market and let it decide, or even rely on government and regulators to define a moral center line while we grumpily ask who the hell they think they are. No. Our industry body must pursue a much more difficult ambition than setting policy by trading down to whatever we can all agree on. All the more since we, employ, since we enjoy the privilege of self-regulation. I think the AA must have a voice independent of its members uh, that holds us to the highest common purpose. That rather than seeking a rickety consensus, our industry body, informed by evidence, research, by the careful consideration of mature opinions should hold its own independent view. It should raise a clear voice in the marketplace that is not merely a compilation of, our, of its members' vested interests. Now, you may say this is no job for an industry body. After all, individual companies can purify their supply chain. Agencies can always refuse to work on tricky products. But if we seek to enhance trust in advertising, we do need leadership. We do need a concerted and centralised effort to define promote and celebrate best practice. Who else is going to say, actually, we think the disclaimer on payday loan advertising is about right. We're not going to go into bat to get it reduced. It's tricky, isn't it? Ethical dilemmas that belong to us uh, and not to somebody else. Who the hell do we think we are? When I first joined the advertising business, someone said to me, I've never owned up to my mother that I work in advertising. She thinks I, I play the piano in a brothel. Uh, <laughs> There's a, a terrible and ironic truth in, the, in that old joke. Uh, advertising has maybe always had something of an image problem. Yet, yet we're good people. You know, in the 40 years, of, ne nearly 40 years that I've been in this business, uh, almost everybody I've met, practically everybody I've met, has, has an effective working conscience. We look after our people, we train them, we invest in them, and we do good things. We support two charities, NABs, which looks out for our own and cares for them, and the Media Trust, which I chair, which connects media companies, agencies, uh, and advertisers to provide enormously valuable skills, uh, training, and resources for thousands of charities who are doing very big work with a very small voice. If you, honestly, if you ever get br browned off with the claptrap of the everyday, and, and who doesn't, I promise you that a few young people given a real chance in life that was frankly out of their reach is better than therapy. It's what good business does. It inspires our people and our recruits that the place that they work and the industry they work in knows it has a responsibility and a purpose in society. Ethical or pragmatic, or just good business, business practice. I think we've established uh, that there's no longer an or. The road I'm proposing is not easy. I, already I can hear the perfectly cogent arguments for leaving things as they are. And I'm not actually sure I know what all the next steps are going to be. But to hold up our heads in today's transparent world of open doors, we can't hide behind the net curtains. We can't duck a point of view. We must be a part of society, not apart from it. A part of the business ethic that ascribes a high value to purpose and values, not apart from that. So yeah, the only way is ethics, and this will not entail dogged worthiness and foregone profits. It's a creative, 
relevant and inspiring challenge for us to map out a new deal. One that is profitable, sustainably profitable, because it is authentic, demanding, and underpinned by a clear sense of our purpose. I say, let's get on with it. Thanks. <laughs>